Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. My name is James Jacob Prash, speaking to you from Morial Ministries on RTN Christian TV. Thank you so much for joining us. Our teaching today is the Devil's Triangle. The Devil's Triangle 666. Uh, we don't like to harp too much on the return of Jesus, but his coming is getting sooner. And the things he warned us to beware of are indeed transpiring. Hence, we respond to the reality of the time in which we live as the Holy Spirit leads us and prompts us. Now, we do teach about other subjects, but increasingly, as we get closer to his return, what the Bible says about end-time prophecy, or the latter days, or the close of the age particularly, what people generally call eschatology, is going to become 
more and more important. Be that as it may, let me read, or read with me please, from the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, 24. We read the following. For false Christs and false prophets will arise. It will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Signs and wonders. This is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Nesim Veniflaot. Signs often have to do with visions or apparitions. With visions or apparitions. Jesus spoke, as we pointed out many times, about deception perpetrated against believers four times more than he warned of anything else as a sign of what will happen in the days and years before he comes. As we always point out, natural disasters, famines, earthquakes, pestilence, wars, rumors of wars, events in the Middle East, he spoke of all of these things. But he spoke about deception four times more than anything else. If possible, the elect will be deceived. Let's read it once more, Matthew 24, 24. And so it goes, false Christs, false prophets will arise, if possible, even the elect, to deceive even the elect, to mislead even the elect, the electos. This is not talking about unbelieving Israel. Satan has had unbelieving Israel seduced and deceived and blinded ever since the rejection of the Messiah. Although, praise God, the eyes of more and more Jewish people are being opened to his Messiahship, as the scriptures said would happen before he comes back. Satan's already got Israel blinded. He certainly has the nations blinded. His target is the church. Now, Satan needs to deceive the church the way he has deceived Israel. But how do we define ecclesia? Breaking it down, we have the false church, a church that's not a church, much the same as Jesus spoke to the church of Philadelphia. He used the word for gathering, gathering, sunagage, and he said it's a sunagage, a gathering of Satan. There are churches that are gatherings of Satan today. They don't really believe the gospel. They're doing things the scripture says are wrong. Same-sex marriage and other things of this nature that they believe are all right. This includes more and more people who you wouldn't think would. But there are churches that never really taught the gospel. My family, my upbringing was primarily Roman Catholic, was Roman Catholic. I didn't know the gospel or about being born again. I knew about sacraments and bowing down to images and superstition, things that the Bible even calls idolatry, but I didn't know about being saved. I didn't know about this. Either the Greek Orthodox people, by and large, either do nominal Protestants or people in liberal Protestantism. This is the false church. It doesn't preach the true gospel, it does not preach the true gospel, and is permeated often by pagan influence. Okay. That's the false church. Then we have the apostate church. People who once knew the truth, but departed from it. Methodism in Britain, founded by John Wesley. They had the truth, but they have by and large departed from it. The Baptist Union, the Baptists in the United States. The Southern Baptist had J.D. Greer, arguing that Christians should be the number one apologists or defenders for homosexuals and lesbians. They departed from the truth. The Southern Baptists had the truth, but they have departed from it, at least their leadership. This is true of many denominations. It's the apostate church, those who once had the truth, but departed from it. So we have the false church that never had the truth to begin with, really. Then we have the apostate church. But that leaves the elect, 
the people who have discernment, supposedly. The people who hold the scriptural truth, supposedly. The people who really do trust, believe, love, follow Jesus, or so the profession is. The elect, the electos. Satan has got the world. Satan has got unbelieving Israel, apart from the faithful remnant of Israel who are the natural branches of the church. Satan has the false church. Satan has the apostate church. I'm telling you, things like Hillsong and the New Apostolic Reformation are in the pocket of Satan. Then there's the elect. That's who he is aiming for now. If possible, the elect will be deceived. If the elect can't be deceived, if it's not possible, why did Jesus warn about it? And why did he highlight it four times? Why would he reiterate the warning if it's not even possible to happen? It's an illogical argument. If possible, the elect will be deceived. Satan's got the false church, he's got the apostate church now. They're going into moral reprobation, total heresy, the emergent church, things like this, ecumenism. He's got all that. Now he's going for those who supposedly hold the scripture and have discernment. That's who he has to get, if possible, the elect. Now notice, he's going to do this by certain means, by signs and wonders, the simvaniflaot, signs being things of a visionary nature and so forth. Well, let's begin. False Christ, it says. False Christ. Jesus said there will be false Christ. He continues talking about this. He warns if they say he's in the wilderness, don't go there. If they say to you that he is uh, in the inner rooms, don't go there. It's not going to be like that. There he is. Don't believe him. False Christ and false prophets will arise. Notice it puts false Christ and false prophets together. The ultimate expression or fulfillment or the ultimate outplaying of this relationship between a false Christ and a false apostle will undoubtedly be what we call the Antichrist and the false prophet of the book of Revelation chapter 13 as we call them. That's not what the text actually calls them, but people know who you mean when you say Antichrist and false prophet. But notice, before they come, there are many of them, many false Christs and many false prophets. The ultimate false Christ and the ultimate false prophet will simply be the climax of the pattern of many of them. It will be the ultimate final expression of many of them when the dragon enters the Antichrist and the false prophet shows up. It happens, it happens, and happens as we get closer to the coming of Jesus. More false Christs, more false prophets promoting them. Ultimately, the false prophet will give power to the Antichrist or to the beast, as we see in Revelation. That pattern is underway, but it's not simply underway in the world. It is underway in the church. I don't just mean things like the Roman papacy, where the Pope says, the Cadius Christus, proclaiming himself to be the vicar of Christ, the one who was in place of Christ, which would translate to Antichrist, Antichristus in Greek. I don't just mean that. I mean people in so-called evangelical circles. I mean people even posing to be among the elect. That's Satan's target, the elect. He's got the rest of the church, by and large. Now the devil is going for the elect. Will false Christs and false prophets who promote them get into the church that professes to be the elect, the discerning church, if you will, that preaches the true gospel? Can he get in? Is he in? Unfortunately, he is. 
Now let's understand the word here. The word here for false Christ is pseudo Christo. Pseudo Christo. And false prophet, pseudo prophetis. These are people who pretend to be the true one. They pretend to be the true one. Pseudo Christ or pseudo Christ and Antichrist, Antichristos, are very similar in their meaning, but not exactly the same. An Antichrist means one who is in place of Christ. One who is in place of Christ. The Islamic religion has Mohammed. Jesus is inferior and subordinate to him. Mohammed is in place of Christ. The Roman papacy, Vicarius Christus, the Pope is in place of Christ. We have this in Mormonism uh, with, with Joseph Smith. We have this in a number of religions, someone in place of Christ. Now, can this get into the church? Well, it already has. At Liberty University, the um, supposed epitome of conservative evangelical education in the eastern United States. The late Jerry Falwell welcomed to the platform the Korean Sun Young Moon, who in his book, The Divine Principle, identified himself as the Lord of the Second Advent and his wife as the Holy Spirit. And he was embraced and welcomed to the platform by Jerry Falwell and called an unsung hero after he got out of prison for fraud. He was actually imprisoned. Mr. Falwell, before he died, called this man an unsung hero because this man gave Liberty University a substantial amount of money. And all the professors of, Unity, of, of Liberty University just sat there and went along with it. They said nothing. Yes, you can get an antichrist in the church. Courtesy of the late Jerry Falwell, it already happened, and this is undeniable. Antichrist, someone who puts themselves in the place of Christ. These people who embrace the Pope of Rome, uh, some would describe the Roman Catholic clergy as the biggest pedophile ring in the world. There is no doubt about it that when this present Pope Francis was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he played a role in the protection of pedophile clergy. That, that, oh, he's the Holy Father. He is, no, he's not. One is your Father who's in heaven. Yes, antichrists get into the church among evangelicals, but even among those who profess to be the elect, the discerning church, the conservative church, many of them professing to be the reformed Calvinist branch of the church who have discernment. That's what happened at Liberty University. This actually happened. Well, let's go further with this. So you have Antichrist and Pseudo-Christ. That is an impersonator of Jesus. An impersonator of Jesus. The ultimate beast of Revelation will be both of these things. Whenever the scripture in either testament speaks of the Antichrist, in a political role, he's referred to as a horn, as a horn, the little horn, uh, prefigured by Antiochus Epiphanes and so forth, the little horn. is a horn is the political aspect. But when it is the political aspect combined with the religious aspect, it's called a beast, a beast. When it's only speaking of the religious aspect in the New Testament, he's referred to as the man of lawlessness, the anthropos and nomon. The man of lawlessness is when it's purely religious. But ultimately, the beast combines all of it. The beast combines antichrist, pseudo-Christ. It combines the political role of antichrist as the horn, and it combines the antichrist as the man of lawlessness spoken of in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, who must be identified before the parousia. Well, let's continue. The ultimate beasts of Revelation, 
the ultimate antichrist and false prophet, will combine all of the above. Be a pseudo-Christ, an antichrist, a horn, and the man of lawlessness. It'll all be him. All the others prefigure him. They foreshadow him, and they, as it were, prepare the way for him. So let's read now, with this background in view, the book of Revelation, chapter 13, the number of the beast chapter. We know from chapter 12, the dragon is Satan himself. The dragon is Satan himself. A dragon that can morph into a serpent, serpent that can morph into a dragon. Remember, Satan represented by the dragon is Satan the attacker. Represented by the serpent, it's Satan the seducer, but they can morph one into another. We have other teachings explaining this. That's why the serpent was cursed in the garden to crawl on its stomach. It was at least a biped, if not a quadruped. It's both a dragon and a serpent, a dragon and a serpent. A snake with legs. I saw, I believe these were, were, were the original dinosaurs. I don't believe dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago. Be that as it may, I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and his horns were as diadems. Now, and he's speaking blasphemous names. Now we see the horns, the political entity. But then we see the religious. They worship the dragon. They worship Satan in verse 4. They worship the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worship the beast saying, who's like the beast? Who's able to wage war with him? He's going to be so powerful, people will worship him thinking he's invincible. Now let's look at what it's really saying. This political figure becomes a religious one who they worship. Those who will take the mark of the beast have not only sold their souls to Satan, but in the process of worshiping the beast, which is what it means, they worship Satan. They become Satan worshipers. I saw the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. This is the peresmos from Revelation 3.10, the great testing that comes upon the whole world or the whole earth. Then it continues. He opened his mouth and blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. By this time, the faithful church is in heaven. The unfaithful church will go into the harlot church. It will become part of the false religious system of the world that will encompass more than false Christianity. The false religious system of the world will be united under the false prophet. The faithful believers will be at this point already raptured and removed. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And another, over authority over every tribe, people, and tongue, and nation, was given to him. And who dwell on the earth will worship him. Now, at some point, some early point, when he's identified with 666, and sets his image up in the temple, we will see the sign of the Son of Man coming. That's what we're going to know it's Jesus. Those who are left will have a choice. They will either take the mark of the beast and worship Satan, or face death. Once the faithful church is removed, the wrath of God, the day of the Lord happens, and his wrath is poured out. The three woes, the seven vials, these things happen. We are not appointed unto wrath. The faithful believers have to be out of here before God's wrath is poured out. But that's what's going to happen. People talk too much about the tribulation saints. The book of Revelation says very little about them. Most of what the book of Revelation and scripture tells us after the rapture, most of what it says shows God turning his redemptive purposes back to Israel and the Jews. 
the age of the church is over, the time of the Gentiles is over. This is not to say there will not be quote-unquote tribulation saints. There are people going to be put in a position where they will either worship Satan and take the mark, or they will be executed. Those will be the tribulation saints. It'll be a death sentence. Something's going to happen with the nation Israel when he's going to try to exterminate them, and he's going to exterminate two-thirds, but I digress. Let's look. All who dwell on the earth. Remember Revelation 3.10, the Perezmos is coming on the earth. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Then we go on. I saw another beast coming up of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and spoke as a dragon. He tries to look like Christ, but he speaks like the devil. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. He is just as powerful as the first beast, the one we generally refer to as Antichrist. Notice the text does not say Antichrist. This is the false prophet. This beast is the one we call the false prophet. All the other false prophets prefigure him, foreshadow him, and set the stage for him. The beast he points people to is the horn, the man of lawlessness, the false Christ, and the Antichrist. The pseudo-Christom and the Antichristom. He is all of them in one person who Satan enters. Now let's look. He makes all on the earth to dwell on it, to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. Notice there'll be a counterfeit of the resurrection. He performs great signs, etc., etc., makes fire come down from heaven. He deceives those who dwell on the earth, once again on the earth, because of the signs which it was given to him in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. We've warned many times, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. The Lord Jesus had miracles, but no miracle crusade. When Jesus healed somebody, his normal response was, shh, don't tell anybody. Or if you have to tell somebody, tell the Levitical priests because we have to keep the Torah. But the main issue was not that I healed you. Sin no more. Did Jesus have healings? Yes. Did he have a healing crusade? No. Did Jesus have miracles? Yes. Did he have a miracle crusade? No. He had a repentance crusade. These signs follow. Those people who are making signs and wonders and miracles and healings the centerpiece of their ministry are false. Jesus never made it the centerpiece of his ministry. They're as wrong on one extreme as the cessationists are on the other. But let's look. Those who dwell on the earth must make an image. So you have a false Christ and you have an image of the false Christ. Well, let's go down. There are those who have the seal of the Lamb and you see this with the 144,000. I won't digress into that at the moment. And you see this in the book of Ezekiel. He causes all small and great, in verse 16, rich and poor, the free men and slaves. And slavery still exists in much of Africa. And high interest debt in slaves people. To be given a mark on the right hand and on the forehead and provides no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. As we have explained before, we have a historical illustration of this, from the Church of Ephesus. 
You can go there today, it's well excavated. And it's a rather amazing place to visit. It's next to a Muslim village called Selchuk, close to the port of Kusidisi. Kusidisi. You can go to Ephesus. Now the beach area that was the port in the time of the apostles is silted in. But the city itself, quite well excavated. You can actually go into the stadium where Paul and Alexander stood and the riot took place. Nonetheless, in the market called an Agora, the main market of Ephesus, there's a cardio, a wide street leading into it. There was a gate over the entrance to the Agora, the market, that said, Caesar, we are Caesar, the son of God. In order to enter the market, you had to acknowledge the deified emperor as God's son. Christians would not do this. They were arrested and they were tied to poles on either side of the cardio for the night trading. They were literally set alight and used as human street lamps, burned alive, and fastened to poles on either side of the cardio in the cardio leading to the agora, the market. In order to buy or sell, you had to acknowledge Caesar as the Son of God. The believers said that Jesus was the Son of God. That illustrates what it's going to be like. Some have speculated, and not without good reason, and they may be right, that a subcutaneous chip implantation is going to be a credit card or a currency. They may be right. There will obviously be a definite mark on the hand or head. It'll be literal, and it will have a spiritual meaning. But all we can determine from Revelation 13 is it will be a permit to buy or sell. You will not be able to engage in any commerce or trading, any shopping or selling without that permit. It may be a currency. We only accept wrist payment or forehead payment. Today, there's places saying, like airplanes, we don't accept cash payment. We only accept card payment. Well, because of COVID-19, there are places saying, like hotels, you can only pay with card. We don't want to handle cash for protection from the viral infection and things of this nature. That's what's happening. Well, it would be very easy to say, we only accept this payment, the subcutaneous implantation of a chip, that could be. But it doesn't have to be a currency. All it has to actually be is a permit to buy or sell. Unless you have the permit, you can't get into the shop. In England, there's these discount shops where you have to be a member. And if you're a member, you can buy things wholesale if you buy in significant quantities. You join something called macro. Now, you have a macro card, but you can't get in without the card. You have to have joined it and got the card to enter the macro to buy things, food, products, everything, wholesale or slightly above. You need the permit to get in. Once you get in, you can pay with cash or credit card or debit card, but you need a permit to get in. That is what the mark of the beast will be. Whether or not it doubles as a credit card or debit card or something, we can only speculate. Easy to see it happening, but what is for sure is it's a permit to buy or sell. Those who take it must worship the Antichrist. In the process of worshiping the Antichrist, they worship the dragon. They become Satan worshipers. They have sold their soul to Satan. That's why, in part, 1 John, speaking of Antichrist, prefaces it by saying, love not the world. Love not the world. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I'm going to risk that anyway. Many times, many, many times, we've pointed out that most of the deceptions of Satan aimed at true believers today are designed to get them to trust in this life and this world. 
What's on back of the word faith money preachers? Trusting in this life and this world. What is on back of the purpose driven lie? Trusting in this life and this world. Okay. What is on back of theonomic reconstructionism, kingdom now, dominion the theology, triumphalism, trusting in this life and in this world. These are all deceptions to keep you on the earth instead of in heaven. Woe to those who dwell on the earth. This is where the hour of testing will come and it will ultimately involve the mark of the beast. So we have the false Christ, his image, and his mark. The false Christ, his image, facilitated by the false prophet, and ultimately his mark. Now let's understand something that is undeniably happening today. I say this not merely with trepidation. I say it with grief and a fear. A fear that true believers are being taken in by this. How can true believers be taken in by a false Christ? How can a discerning church be taken in by a false Christ? Well, the same way Jerry Falwell and the professors at Liberty University welcomed an antichrist, a self-professed antichrist who said he was the Lord of the Second Advent, who said he was the return of Christ and his wife was the Holy Spirit, who said that Jesus failed in his mission and he came to succeed when Jesus failed, Sun Young Moon, the Korean cult leader and antichrist. How could that happen at Liberty University, the supposed bastion? of theological higher education for conservative evangelicals on the East Coast. How could Satan have gotten in that far? But he did. This is the full-fledged Antichrist. How can a false Christ get in to good churches, to biblically-based churches? How can this happen? Well, let's look at how it's happening. I refer to Doreen Virtue. Look at her description of the Jesus that came. This is what she says. The scene changed. She disappeared. The church disappeared. All the people disappeared. And there was Jesus right in front of me, standing there, well, floating, really. Floating. And he was glowing. And he was glowing so brightly that I don't even know how I could explain it, but it was this glow all around him, and especially from his heart. And the glow was this, this candle-like color, this, this white, white color, like you'd see um, eggshell color or candle-like color, and this smile on his face. And he was looking at me, but it wasn't a sense of me personally, like my ego, it was a sense of everyone, and that included me. And when I saw him, it was a whole different experience than I'd ever had in seeing the angels or any of the work I'd done before. This was the most three-dimensional experience I've ever seen. And, the, and I was blown back like this in my chair. I don't know how long it lasted. All I know is that when he showed up, a few things became my knowledge. I went from believing to knowing that he is real. Notice she said it was real. It's three-dimensional. It is not a vision. It is an apparition. Now Jesus warns, if anybody says I've returned physically, don't believe it. He's coming back the way he left. Don't believe people like that. But she actually claims to have had an apparition of Jesus. A pseudo-Christon. A false Christophany. How do we know it is false? Let's look. Well, she has a picture painted of him by a professional artist according to her description of this Jesus that appeared to her 
not in a vision, but in an actual apparition that was three-dimensional, so she claims. And this caused her, she testifies, to become a Christian. Well, the book of Revelation speaks of white hair. Hers does not have white hair. It has brunette. It's a brunette hair. But let's forget that for the moment. Look at the hands, the arms, the radius, the metacarpal, as we said on our previous video. Her Jesus was not crucified for our sin. After raising from the dead, Jesus still had the stigmata, the marks, by which he identified himself to Thomas. When he returns in Zechariah 12, verse 10, they'll look upon me who they have pierced. In Revelation 1, 7, when he comes back, they'll see the one who was pierced. Isaiah 49, we are engraved on his hands for all eternity. Even in heaven, even when he returns, Jesus is the crucified Lord who was resurrected. You see the pierce marks? This is because I loved you. This is how I saved you. I was crucified in your place. You're graven on my hands for all eternity. Now, it could be a little bit complicated. The Hebrew word for hand and, and arm is the same, yad, and then it's translated to Greek. It is more likely that it was the radius instead of the metacarpal, but it's there. The stigmata, as some call it, is there. The pierce marks are there. The real Jesus is always pierced, but her Jesus was not crucified for our sin. There are no pierce marks. This is a pseudo Christon, a false Christ. Pretending to be Christ, but obviously not the real one. And she says his sacred heart was shining out. Now, if you're from a Catholic or Greek Orthodox background, or even sometimes Lutheran background, you'll know what the Sacred Heart of Jesus is. Go on the internet and Google photos of the Sacred Heart, you'll see dozens of them. Dozens of icons, paintings. Sometimes he's actually holding it. Sometimes it's being revealed from his chest. It is a heart that has been pierced. Some of the depictions still have swords in it. It's usually wrapped in thorns and slashed open with blood dripping from it. It was cut with a sword, and sometimes the swords are in it, in some of the depictions, others not. But almost always it is wrapped in thorns, and you always see the blood coming out of the pierce of, of where it was killed. It was the heart of a dead person. It was the heart of somebody whose heart was cut open somebody who was killed and light comes from it now in Revelation what do we see he was slain and the image becomes of somebody who was slain an image is made of the one who was slain this is Doreen Virtue's false Christophany. This is Doreen Virtue's pseudo Christon. This is a false Christ. This is the very thing that the Lord Jesus warned about. This is not the true Christ. Now again, we have other issues. In Roman Catholicism, they believe the bread and wine is transubstantiated and Jesus returns physically. Lutherans believe in consubstantiation. They do not say that there is a transubstantiation into protoplasm under the appearances of bread and wine. They say, though, that it's the true body, the true blood. Jesus is actually there. That is the meaning of consubstantiation. Many people who don't understand Lutheranism think consubstantiation means Jesus came in some spiritual sense together with the bread and wine. That's not what it means. Consubstantiation means it's the true body and true blood. It's the same as Catholicism minus the transubstantiation. It's a Eucharistic Christ in effect, or a sanitized Eucharistic Christ. As we've said many times, uh, catechetical Lutheranism is the 
half-brother of Roman Catholicism. But when it comes to consubstantiation and transubstantiation, Lutheranism and Roman Catholicism are non-identical twins. That's all they are, is non-identical twins. Remember, Lutheranism, particularly catechetical Lutheranism, is a hybrid that is half Roman Catholic and half Protestant. It is not Protestant, it is not Catholic, it is a hybrid. And consubstantiation is the non-identical twin of transubstantiation. They say this is the true body, this is the true blood. They don't look upon it as a mere memorial. Now Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. The Last Supper, which was a Paschal Seder, what he would have said was, Do this in remembrance of me. This is my body broken for you. Or he would have said, This cup is the cup of the new covenant of my blood poured out. Do this in remembrance. It's a memorial. The Passover is a memorial. The Jews look back to the Exodus with Moses and they look forward to the coming messianic redemption of the Messiah. So we're told in 1 Corinthians, Christ is our Passover, the Lord's Supper is our Paschal Seder. When we eat it, we look back to the cross and the grave and resurrection, and we look forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I will eat it again with you in the kingdom of my Father, Jesus said. Like the Jewish Passover, looks back to the Exodus and looks forward to the Messiah, when we take the Lord's Supper, our Passover, we look back to the cross and resurrection, and we look forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb, of which the Lord's Supper is both an appetizer and a, of the marriage supper and a memorial of his death and resurrection. We look back, we look forward. When you understand the Passover, you understand how ridiculous the Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and the catechetical Lutheran distortion of the scripture really is concerning the Eucharist, communion, the Lord's Supper, etc. I believe it's a literal return of Christ. She said this was real, three-dimensional. He came to her and she saw his heart, this death heart, you know, and the light was coming out, shining on people in this quote-unquote, gay-friendly Episcopal Church. This is what she said. So you have a false Christ. Not the one who was crucified for our sin. A false Christophany, indisputably a false Christ. How does this false Christ get in to the body of Christ to deceive the elect, to deceive people of discernment? Well, let's watch who's promoting her. Let's watch Chris Roseboro. Beautifully said. We're so grateful for your time. You're, you're such an articulate and clear teacher mm -hmm. of God's truth. And we're truly blessed from you sharing this time with us. Well, thank you for having me. It's, it, it's an honor to be able to serve you and to, to serve the people who watch your channel in, in, in this way. So. Well, we just pray again that you go over to Chris Rosebro's Fighting for the Faith YouTube channel. When Dorian's friend Chris Rosebro, the pirate Christian hypocrite, isn't dressing like this, or preaching in front of this Jesus statue, or driving his pirate Christian mobile, he's casually accepting visions of Jesus as if it were normal, asking no follow-up questions. And so I had a vision on January 7th, 2017 at church um, and, it, and I saw a vision of Jesus. He wasn't moving around like he was a personal, you know, vision coming to me. It was more like a, kind of a glimpse in heaven, I guess. Like the veil was lifted is what it seemed like. And, and the light coming out of his heart uh, was brighter than anything I've ever seen. But he's supposed to be a discernment expert. Here he is, with Doreen Virtue, promoting her. She's talking about her vision. 
It's in her book. She's got no problem. He promotes this. Well, I suppose his belief in the consubstantiation might predispose him to it. He has no problem with Christ coming in some physical way before the parousia, before the rapture and resurrection. There he is. So Chris Roseborough brings this into the church. Now notice what happens when you have a false Christ who was killed. There's the heart with the blood coming out. Heart of a dead man. We're told in Revelation that the false prophet makes an image of the false Christ. The false prophet makes an image of the false Christ. Am I saying that Chris Rosebro is the false prophet of Revelation 13? No. Am I saying that he is proven to be a false prophet of Matthew 24 who's setting the stage for the false prophet of Revelation 13? Absolutely. We read from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 13 If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder even, even if he's a hyper-charismatic. Now, the sign, she claims that it was not just a vision, but an apparition. What a sign. You understand in Catholic thinking, Fatima lords these alleged Mariophanies in Nakhon, Ireland and so forth, and Guadalupe, Mexico, there's a sign. And Fatima, they said, give us a sign. And people testified to see some kind of a phenomena in the sun. Doreen Virtue was the same. A sign. The light was radiating from the heart of a dead man. And if he comes to you, concerning which he speaks to say to you, let's go after this other God. Chris Rosebro sat there, went along with this, promoted her ministry, sanctioned it, in order to give it credence, to lend it credence and give it credibility among people who are supposedly into discernment. That prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. He's counseled rebellion against the Lord. Now we don't stone people like him anymore, but the sin is no less serious. We may be under grace, not law, but the sin is no less serious. Chris Rosebro has by scriptural definition counseled rebellion against the Lord. Christ is God incarnate, fully human and fully divine. The three-dimensional Jesus she saw that was not crucified is a false Christ. It's not our Messiah, not our Savior, not our God. It's a false Christ. He promoted it. That's a false prophet. Am I saying that the false Christ of Doreen Virtue is the ultimate beast of Revelation? No. Is it a false Christ? Absolutely. Is it opening up evangelicals to the coming deception of the ultimate antichrist, the beast? Absolutely. That's how Satan is using it. He's bringing this false Christ into conservative, reformed evangelical circles. Through people like Doreen Virtue, who maybe doesn't know much better. She may not even be a believer. If she is, she's only been saved three years. But if she is a believer, how can you become a believer through a false Christ? 
Only a true Christ can save you and bring you to salvation, not a false one. That's a question in itself. But you would think someone like Chris Rosebro would know better. He doesn't. He has no problem with it. False prophet points to the false god, the false messiah, whatever. As we see in Revelation, the false prophet always points people to the false Christ. And that's what he did. But it was not only him. Of all people, let's watch from Master Seminary and Grace to You, John MacArthur's right-hand man, Phil Johnson, and Doreen Virtue. Let's watch. And today we're going to be talking about a topic that we're getting a lot of letters about. People are worried about the mark of the beast, which of course is discussed in Revelation 13 and throughout Revelation. We're going to uh, break this down to separate fact from fiction, to really see what the Bible says, what God's word, that the authority says, and not add to it, not twist it. We're going to see what does God say about the mark of the beast because, okay. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, um, and this kind of circles back to John MacArthur, who Lauren and I both listen to and, and trust. And of course, you work so closely with him. Is There was, there was a debacle, um, and probably taken out of context, with apparently people are saying, and I saw the clip, John MacArthur saying that you could take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven, where um, the Bible seems to imply that it's an unforgivable sin, in some some way of course we know jesus said there's only one unforgivable sin uh so i wondered if you could kind of help us understand what really happened with that clip with um yeah Pastor that clip John. actually the clip actually uh is from a q a so it was a spontaneous question that came mm -hmm. up uh, unrehearsed and all that in a q a session probably 30 years ago or longer i think it was in the wow. 1980s i forget the exact date wow uh, but someone asked, uh, someone who was, who was motivated by concern about what if, what if one of my relatives who doesn't know Christ takes the mark and then they hear the gospel and repent of having taken the mark, would that be a forgivable sin? So it's a hypothetical question, a mm -hmm. hypo, hypothetical scenario. I, I, I don't know that it would ever happen that someone who took the mark, because as I said, it seems to involve a deliberate oath of fealty to the Antichrist. So I don't know that anyone who ever took the mark would actually repent or even be capable of repentance. But suppose they did, was the question. Would that be a forgivable sin? And John MacArthur, I think, rightly said, yeah, if the person genuinely repented, Jesus is pretty clear, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men, except, he says, the mm -hmm. blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That's Matthew 12, and he's describing an incident there that had just occurred where these Pharisees who yeah. knew very Don't get obsessed with end times prophecies, and don't mm -hmm. twist yourself with fear. Trust in the Lord. Know that he's sovereign. He only allows what he allows on this earth. I always am comforting, comforted by the book of Job, too. Yeah, yeah. He, he's got evil on a very short leash. Definitely. That's a good yeah. point. Well, this has been so helpful. You've been just amazingly delightful, Pastor Phil. Thank you. And um, I just want to encourage everyone to go to your website, romans45.org, and just dig into these blogs. Thank you again for your time. I hope you'll come back and be with us again. Anytime. Thank you. That's disturbing. Notice Doreen Virtue is engaging him, and he is engaging her on defending John MacArthur's teaching concerning taking the mark of the beast. This is Phil Johnson. Why is Phil Johnson sanctioning this woman and her vision? He doesn't criticize it. He doesn't oppose it. Why is he endorsing it? Why is Master Seminary pushing a false Christ? It's obviously not the true one. He wasn't crucified for our sin. If possible, the elect will be deceived. False Christ is being brought by false prophets into the circle of the elect. 
what's supposed to be the discerning church, the doctrinally knowledgeable church, much of it the so-called reformed church. But there's the false Christ, and there are his agents promoting it. The videos are documented proof they speak for themselves. And then they begin defending the teaching on the mark, which we'll come to momentarily. But let's go back to the false prophet, Chris Roseborough, the man who scripture says counsels rebellion against the Lord. Let's look at him. Remember, it's a false prophet who makes the image of the false Christ. Let's have a look at Mr. Roseborough dressed up in his Babylonian wardrobe, worshiping in front of a graven image, supposedly of Jesus. Now remember, he already believes in consubstantiation. Look at his statue. Look at him standing before it. His church is loaded with icons, candles, altars, and the graven image. In the Ten Commandments, we read the following in the Decalogue. The second commandment is, you shall not make a graven image of anything on heaven above or earth beneath. You shall not bow down to them or serve them from the book of Exodus chapter 20. That's exactly what it says in Hebrew. That's exactly what it says in the faithful translations of scripture. Exactly what it says. The Lord said, if you take anything out of my word, you're accursed. It's the last thing he said. Don't add, don't take away. Well, the Roman Catholic Church took it out. And they made the tenth commandment, thou shalt not covet, into two, so they would still artificially have ten. Now, by the way, even Master Seminary teaches the original ten. You shall not make an image. Putting flowers and candles in front of an image and saying prayers? The Hebrew terms are the following. One is hishtahavot, hishtakvaya. When you bow before an image or pay an image homage. The other is avodah zerah, literally alien worship, strange worship. In Hebrew, the term for idolatry, avodat zerah, is the same as the term for unscriptural worship. Whenever you engage in unscriptural worship, God counts it as idolatry. This is what Jesus meant when he told the woman at the well in John 4. The Father wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. If the spirit is right, the doctrine will be right. Bowing down to an image, paying homage to an image, that's not truth. God does not accept that as worship. God calls it idolatry. Once you begin worshiping the true God in the wrong way, you will wind up with other gods, with other Christs, like the one promoted by Chris Rosebro and Phil Johnson, presented by Dorian Virtue. You shall not make a graven image. Now what happens to people who do it? Now we're not talking here about art. We're not talking about the theme paintings of Rembrandt in a museum or Michelangelo's sculptor of David. We're talking about making these objects of some kind of religious veneration putting them on an altar or a platform and standing before them when you pray and putting flowers and candles around them. 
or the Catholics and Greek Orthodox burning incense even. Well, let's look. Their idols are silver and gold. Take a good look at Chris Rosebro's idol. The work of a man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. Those who make them will become like them. Everyone who trusts in them. If this is what you're into, if this is your version of Christianity, with the icons and graven images, even the Nehushtan that God instructed Israel to make had to be destroyed when it became an object of worship or veneration. Well, let's look at this. The, the Hushtan is the bronze, sorry, the bronze serpent. Destroyed in the days of Hezekiah because it was misused. Art is one thing. Sacramentals, as Catholics call it, or putting these things in your church instead of a museum. That's something else. <laughs> Notice it doesn't have the features of Christ in, in, in Scripture. Can you imagine an Oriental Jew looking like that? I can't. But let's understand what's happening here. They have, have eyes, but they can't see. Noses, but they can't smell. Mouths, but they cannot speak. Ears, but they cannot hear. Hands, but they cannot feel. Feet, but they cannot walk. Those who make them will become like them. Chris Rosebro is blind. He's blinded by religion. He cannot see. He's got his graven image, but he's just like it. That statue can't see, and either can he. He can't see what he's doing is a deception. As Paul said to Timothy, they will come deceiving and being deceived. He has ears, but he cannot hear. You can't talk sense to him. He's a religious narcissist and too proud to listen to anybody. He has a voice, but he can't speak. When he tries to defend these issues, he speaks nonsense. Listen to his teaching on confession. We played it on our previous tape. He says that as a Lutheran pastor, a catechetical Lutheran, he has a vow that gives him the authority to forgive sin. That you confess your sins to him in auricular confession, as in Roman Catholicism, and to have your sins forgiven, you tell them to him confessionally, and then he forgives you by giving you absolution. Oh my Lord, the scripture tells us, the scripture tells us to confess our sins to one another. If you wrong a brother or a brother or sister wrong you, they can confess to you. You can confess to them and ask forgiveness from them for what they did, what you did, whatever. Or evangelistically in John 20, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven, whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. When you witness or preach the gospel to an unsaved person, if they truly repent, you can pronounce them forgiven. And if they don't, you can tell them they're still damned until and unless they do repent. But no place is that authority given to any clergy class. A clergy class is what the New Testament calls Nicolaitanism. Nicolaity, suppressors of the people, as opposed to the priesthood of all believers. We all have the power of binding and loosing. The church has it. It doesn't give it only to the leaders. This is Roman Catholicism. It's like the Levitical priesthood of the Old Testament, back under the law. They claim to have a power over the people that the people don't have. Jesus hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. 
Well, there he is saying he can forgive your sin. He actually says on the recording, listen to it. If you want to have your sins forgiven, you have to go tell him and he can forgive you. Now, what does the epistle of John tell us? First John tells us something very, very different about the forgiveness of sins. We are told to confess our sin to the Lord. To confess our sin to him. In 1 John yeah. chapter 1, verse 9. Okay. If we confess our sins, he, Jesus, is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Only Jesus can forgive our sins. We can forgive each other for what we've done, but we cannot forgive the sin. Only Christ died for the sin. Only Christ atoned for the sin. Only Christ can forgive the sin. Only Christ can justify the sinner. Not a priest, not a Lutheran pastor. They cannot give you absolution. They cannot take away your sin. There is nothing in scripture that says a clergy class has the power to do that. Only Jesus can do that. Forgiveness does not come from confessing your sins to him as he teaches. The pronouncement of forgiveness does not come from his voice. He is right and just to forgive, and he is not Chris Rosebro, it is Jesus. Now notice what happens when he says forgiveness of sins comes from confessing your sin to him. That's exactly what he says on his recording. That's what he teaches. That's what he wants you to believe. He puts himself in place of Christ. Antichristos. This is an antichrist practice. At least in Roman Catholicism, they admit it. They say that the priest is a surrogate Christ, or that the Pope is the vicar of Christ. Again, Lutheranism is simply, at least his brand of Lutheranism, is a pseudo-sanitized Roman Catholicism. The man puts himself in place of Christ. He's a false prophet who makes an image of the false Christ. Now look at Doreen Virtues, false Christ. And look at Chris Rosebros. He makes an image of the false Christ. He's got a blonde, she's got a brunette. It's ridiculous. But it's demonic. It's avodah zerah. It's idolatrous. Can't see it. Like the idol itself. Eyes that do not see. It can't tell them ears that do not hear. And they can only speak rubbish. Mouths that cannot speak. They can't speak the word of God. Feet that can't go anywhere. They can't walk in the spirit. They can't feel. They have no sense about them. Noses that cannot smell. They have no real discernment. They have no, they can't smell what's right and wrong. They can't feel. If they did, they wouldn't do those things. They wouldn't violate the Ten Commandments, much less edit it. Edit it out of God's word in order to accommodate and facilitate their idolatry. That's what it amounts to. But let's go further with this. Different people pervert the scriptures in different ways. We have another term for scripture, uh, in scripture, for antichrist that most people don't normally think of or may not be aware of. Pseudo-logon. Pseudo-logon. Jesus is the logos. False religions have a pseudo-logon. In Islam, it's the Quran. In Hinduism, it's the Bhagavad Gita. Okay. In Mormonism, it's the Book of Mormon. 
and Catholicism, it's the Summa Theologiae and the Papal Encyclicals. There's, they all have another book that they read the scripture through the prism of it. This is certainly Talmudic Judaism, Rabbinic Judaism. They have a pseudo Logan, all of them. But that's only one trick. We saw how the Roman Church and the Lutherans take out the Second Commandment. Luther went beyond that because he didn't understand the epistle of James and what it meant about works. He decided it wasn't scriptural. It was not canonical. He hated it. He ripped it out. The book of Revelation. He couldn't understand it. He disliked it. So he ripped it out. We see people like Eugene Peterson, The Message, Rick Warren's Bible of Choice. They changed the text. Inclusive Bibles, Jehovah's Witnesses, they doctor the text. Roman Catholics, imitated by catechetical Lutherans, they edit the text. But Luther himself, if he didn't like something, if he didn't like the epistle of James, he didn't like to rip it out. If he didn't like the book of Revelation, rip it out. That's why Chris Rosebro says the book of Revelation is all symbolic. There's no three and a half years. There's no actual antichrist. It's not to be taken literally. This is what he teaches. It's because Luther ripped it out. Now Luther began right. Luther began right, but he ended wrongly, like King Joash. Nobody began more correctly than Luther, but few people have en ended more badly. May the Lord have mercy on the rest of us and stop us from making the mistakes he did, but he began right. But when you rip books out of the New Testament and say they're not canonical, they're not part of God's word because you disagree with them or because you can't understand him, this was Luther, and that influence is in the catechetical Lutheranism of Chris Rosebro. That's why he says the book of Revelation is only cyclical and symbolic and has no actual meaning, future events or present events. He's deluded. He's, he followed Luther. If you don't like it, rip it out. Well, Jesus said anyone who takes away from this book is cursed. His brand of Lutheranism is cursed of God. At least if they really follow Luther. Now they tried to salvage or amend it by saying these books are in there, we'll put them back in, but we just won't emphasize them. And that's, that's where, where he comes from. This is a false prophet who makes the image. That's what he does. I've said that this man is a religious narcissist. Chris Rosebro, false prophet, is a religious narcissist. Now, when you have someone who's like that, people recognize it, and they even say it. I don't mean people who disagree with you or who are your opponents. I mean people in your own circle people who are under your roof. They see something is wrong with you. The people around him know there's something wrong with him. This is not gossip or rumor. They do not disagree privately. They disagree publicly and put it up on the internet. Some of them even make videos. These are the people around him. Let's look at what Doreen Virtue says about the false prophet who promotes her apparition. She says he's sarcastic and harsh. <laughs> In other words, he has an unholy arrogance about him. Doreen Virtue says there's something wrong with them. P. 
people who related to him by marriage. I don't want to go into it, but allegations of homosexuality that were not denied by a member of his family, not formally denied, uh, at least an orientation towards it, that ended in a divorce that was very ugly and came to involve lawyers and threats and so forth. People related to him by marriage say because of the way he mishandled the situation within his family, he's unfit for the ministry. These were people who were in his house. They were related to him by marriage closely. And they say there's something wrong with this man. So they say, not me. Well, let's look at the Reverend Jordan Cooper, another Lutheran minister, akin to Chris Rosebro. One of his own people, one of his own clergy, one of what he is. Let's look at what this fellow Lutheran minister who used to work with him says. He says, there's something wrong with him. I can't work with him anymore. Look the way he operates. Look what he does. I'm disassociating in ministry from Chris Rosebro. I'm just not going to work with him anymore. This is another Lutheran minister. Now, he was tried to be gracious about it. Believe me, if Doreen Virtue says there's something wrong with you, she ought to know. Well, let's go further. A lovely lady, originally from... Ireland, I believe, who lives in America, the best friend of Chris Rosebro's daughter, a close family friend of him and his wife and the family, uh, who listened to his teaching about the sermon for nine years. Her name is Laura. She's produced two videos when she found out what he really believed and what he really is. She calls him a false teacher. Here's the video. I have listened to Chris Roseboro for nine years, not really knowing that they were Lutheran and not really understanding that they preach a different gospel. I even have written to his wife, Barb. I was friends with his daughter. And uh, I'm actually nearly in tears here, but please just bear with me. This is a close family friend. These are people related to him by marriage. This is other Lutheran ministers, even Doreen Virtue. They all say there's something wrong with this man. And they're right. There is something wrong. And it's not just psychologically. It's spiritually. The ministry of these false prophets is nothing short of demonic. They make an image of the false Christ and it gets into evangelical conservative circles. There's people listening to him who think he's the same as Todd Friel or J.D. Hall or something like this, but they don't know what he really believes. That the book of Revelation is, it's not literal, it's all symbolic, there's no three and a half years. He goes on to say that the millennium, the millennial reign of Christ, as we pointed out on the previous video, has been going on since the ascension. Satan has been bound since the ascension of Christ. For 2,000 years, we've been in the 1,000 year reign since the ascension of Christ. It's all symbolic. 
Well, if Satan was bound, why were the Christians thrown to the lions in the Colosseum and devoured? What happened? The lion got tired of laying down with the lamb and needed a break, so he went on a lunch break and devoured some Christians? This is lunacy. Then he says, the judgments in Revelation, like the vials of wrath, are concurrent with the millennium. How can the reign of Christ on earth, when the lion is lying down with the lamb, be concurrent with the wrath of God being poured out? Paul makes it clear, we are not appointed unto wrath, the Greek word being orge. The faithful church won't even be here for it. Now notice, even John MacArthur and, and, and J.D. Hall and, and, and Phil Johnson would say this stuff is crazy. Even they don't agree with him. There's something wrong with him, theologically. There's something wrong with his mind. And there's something wrong with him spiritually. Let's look at this. So you have the false Christ among conservative discerning evangelicals being promoted by Phil Johnson and especially by Chris Roseborough. Why wouldn't he? He makes an image of the dead one holding his dead heart bleeding. He makes an image of it. Uh, as she describes him with the light coming out of the heart. He's got an image of him. She's got a, another Christ who was not crucified for our sin. She has one that looks Italian or Greek. He's got one that looks Norwegian. But neither one of them is real. And again, you can't tell him. Or he, he has ears, but he can't hear. He can't see this is wrong. He has eyes, but he cannot see. He can't discern. He has a nose, but he cannot smell. You become like it. When you do what he's done, you become like it. You've counseled rebellion against the Lord. Compounded by religious narcissism? Now, when people who don't like you or are opposed to you criticize you and attack you, that's to be expected. For instance, in Great Britain we have Studio Scotland. I used to work with them, Deborah and Stuart Manilaws. They began promoting David Nathan who teaches, God the Father is not the creator, the blood of animals can take away sin in the millennium, and did this bit in a video where you can pray the power of God's spirit into a tire jacket and knock people over for healing. I oppose this, they promoted him, and they got very angry at me. I allowed them to make a film in which I narrated it. It was built around my narration called The Daniel Project, and I did it pro bono, gratis, because I was told I was doing it for the Lord, for evangelism. They paid the secular actors. Then they took this film that I did for the Lord, that they didn't pay me for, not that I wanted the money, because I thought it was for the Lord, so I did it pro bono, but they paid the unsaved secular talent. And then they sold it to Hollywood, to California Paramount Pictures. They actually sold it to the world after saying it was done for Christ. They get Christians to work for free. They pay the unsaved people. High rates. And then they sell it to the world. Then they take the proceeds from that and make another film that has acting in it, in which they also use me in footage. And they get Christians to be extras, and you're doing it for the Lord. And they sold that to communist Chinese, to the communist Chinese that are persecuting Christians, making sure it would never be translated into Mandarin and used to evangelize. The Chinese bought the thing. You sold it to Hollywood, to the world, even to the communist Chinese that persecute the church. This is the Menelaus. This is Studio Scotland. I oppose this. Some people told me that it's a, that they're, scam, they're scam artists that use religion. I, I, I didn't say they're scam artists. I don't think maybe I did. But I just arrived at the conclusion that they were not in ministry. They were in the ministry business. And they hate me, and they're always sniping at me indirectly through Bethel or through this little effeminate 
Jockey Smith, the Japanese cutie is what his name means. All these lies and fabrications, things that are really stupid. And uh, all this gossip, it, they, all they can do is attack this, but they won't deal with the issues. And then they have the audacity to continue selling the film of me, featuring me, and making money on me while cursing me. This is complete hypocrisy. I don't respect these people, I don't like them, I don't trust them, and they say all kinds of bad things about me through their fronts, like the little Japanese cutie and Jockey Smith and things like this. I know about them and their colleague Rogers. They say, okay, these people don't like me. I've been attacked in the Jewish Chronicle for evangelizing Jews. Orthodox rabbis don't like me. There's been ecumenical people like Robert Sungenis, I was supposed to debate, Catholic apologist, he doesn't like me. He doesn't like me. I've had it out with Muslims on the internet. He don't like me. I had it out with hyper Calvinists like James White on the internet. He don't like me. I've had it out with all kinds of people who don't like me. I expect them to say things about me that are not nice. I expect them to attack me. But when people in your own circle, under your own roof, fellow Lutheran ministers, people related to you by marriage, uh, family, friends, say, putting up videos saying you're a false teacher, even Doreen Virtue saying there's something wrong with you. And they're not saying this privately. It's not gossip. They say it publicly. They post it on the internet because they want everyone to know about it. They make videos about it. They tweet about it. These are his own people, his own circle, under his own roof, saying there's something wrong with him. Yet he wants to deflect all this and say, I'm the opponent. If I didn't exist, he'd have the same problem. There's something wrong with this man. Yes, he's a religious narcissist. But by scriptural definition, he's a false prophet. He has an antichrist spirit who puts himself in the place of Christ, claiming the authority to absolve and forgive sin if you tell them to him. In addition to his other sacramentalism. This is a Nicolaitan. This is an antichrist spirit. He's got a problem. He makes this, he has this graven image. Again, Doreen Virtue's got the same. She's got the icon, he's got the icon. The false prophet always makes the image of the false Christ. Then we get to the third. The false Christ, his image, and his mark. Well, we've talked about what the mark may or may not be. It's certainly going to be a permit to trade. Theoretically, it could be a currency. But it means you've worshipped the Antichrist and you've worshipped Satan. You've literally sold your soul to Satan. And once the rapture happens and the faithful church is rescued, concurrent with the resurrection, taking it means you're condemned to hell. Not taking it and turning to Christ means they'll behead you or kill you. That's what it says. That's the tribulation saints. Now there's other things in this about Israel and so forth and the two witnesses, but I'm just dealing with this. This is terrible. Uh, three times the book of Revelation tells us whoever takes the mark is damned they're down to the lake of fire. You've sold your soul to the devil. He owns it. You've worshipped Satan. You've bowed to that image. You've taken his mark. No place does it say these people can be forgiven. But in Revelation 14, the smoke of their torment goes up, and yow, tau, and yow, as I've said, forever and ever in Greek. Revelation 16, they're finished. 
Revelation 20, they're not in the resurrection of the righteous. They're not in the millennium. It's only those who were beheaded for not taking the mark. There's not a hint that these people have any chance of forgiveness or salvation. John MacArthur says, not only is it possible to be forgiven for this, but there's people who are going to be. Now his apologists like Phil Johnson have tried to make capital out of the fact, as did other adjuncts and syncophants, that, well, it's not the unforgivable sin. That's changing the narrative. That's not the point. That's not the issue. Whether it's the unforgivable sin or not is irrelevant. John MacArthur doesn't mention the unforgivable sin in his reply to the question. It's the fact people will not repent. Whoever takes the mark is doomed. There's no repentance. Elsewhere in Revelation we read that in this five-month period and so forth, men still did not repent of their wicked deeds. No place is there a suggestion or a hint that anybody is going to be saved who takes that mark. On the contrary, three times emphatically the Greek text and English translation make it clear that they are permanently and eternally doomed. Nowhere does it say you can take that mark and still be saved and go to heaven. This is the teaching of John MacArthur. Listen to what he says. He not only says it's possible, he says people will actually do it. It's in regard to the latter half of the tribulation period when, when men would be required to have the mark of the beast in order to buy or sell. My question is, uh, once a person takes the mark, is there any possibility of him coming to Christ? Yes. Uh, I think, you know, in the seven-year tribulation coming in the future, we're going to get into this so probably a week from Sunday night, maybe this Sunday night, maybe a week, I'm not sure. But um, the tribulation is a seven-year period, right? The rapture of the church, seven-year tribulation, then Christ returns, sets up his kingdom. Now, in that seven-year period, really two things happen. God begins to judge the world with a series of holocausts and at the same time he begins to redeem his people Israel and in the process of this the Antichrist establishes his rule and in order to function in the economy of the Antichrist you have to take the mark of the beast now the question is if you're living in the tribulation period and you take this mark in other words you identify with the beasts empire will you still be able to be redeemed and I think the answer to that is yes Yes, otherwise there would be no salvation of anybody in the end of the tribulation. So I don't think the fact that someone takes that is a sentence to it to permanency any more than you being a part of this world system once in your life means you have to be a part of the system all your life. Now this is not the first time John MacArthur has gotten himself in trouble with his doctrine, even among his fellow Reformed and conservative Baptist types. His teaching on the blood of Christ was seen as denigrating its efficacy by many of his fellow Reformed Baptists. This is not the first time he's said something that disturbed a lot of people. But he said it's going to happen. Not just that it can happen or it's not the unforgivable sin. He didn't mention that. He said there's going to be people who do it. When three times the book of Revelation says there will not be people who do it. They're not going to repent. Yet they try to defend him. This too is the working of Satan. This is what Chris Rosebro is defending. This is what Doreen Virtue is defending. This is what Phil Johnson is defending. They're trying to defend this. Trying to defend this. But they can't defend it. <laughs> They can only try to change the narrative and deflect. Oh, it's not the unpardonable sin. Okay, what does that have to do with anything? Nobody is going to repent anyway. Whoever takes it. Now, I've offered to debate Phil Johnson on this subject. And I've twice offered to debate 
Chris Roseboro on his defense of John MacArthur and on his support of the ministry of Doreen Virtue with her false Christ. He won't do it. He's attacked me on everything except doctrine. He's raised one nonsense after another. Stupid things. First, he tried to say I was a cult leader. That's absurd. I'm not in a cult. We don't even have any members. Our members all attend mainstream churches, some house churches, but there's no organization with a leader. It's not a cult. I've been on platforms of major evangelical leaders. Nobody's ever considered me or said I was that, except this one guy in league with the Menelaws, the promoters of David Nathan, who said I was. He's somebody from an organization called Catalyst that admits they have no religious beliefs of their own. They're not Christians, they say. And they say on their website they will represent people of any faith. Mormons, Muslims, Buddhists. They just had a big scandal involving Hindus recently. And people of any sexual orientation. Lesbians, homosexuals, transgender, bisexual. That's where Chris Rosebro went to get a case against me. Then he went to my genealogy. I've made this clear. I will state a few verifiable facts that I told him I'm willing to bring the documentation and proof to any debate. He said, I am not of Jewish ancestry and my name is not Jacob. Fact one, I'm named after an ancestor named Jacob. It was anglicized to James when they came to the United States. And when I went to Israel, James is funny. In Hebrew, James is Jacob or Yaakov. And I showed the ID and I explained how it happened. Fact one. Fact two. My ancestral name was actually not Prash, but Brash. Go Google it on Wikipedia. You'll see it as a prominent Jewish name. Point three. I have never stated that my father is Jewish. I said that he is of Jewish descent as my own DNA confirms. Where Chris Rosebro got this pie chart with my DNA, I have no idea he made it up. What he seems to have done is taken nationality and misrepresented it as ethnic identity. I do not have even 1% of German DNA. Not even 1%. I can prove it. Next fact, I was sent to the Jewish Community Center in my youth. But I did not grow up in the Jewish faith. I grew up Roman Catholic, largely because of my mother. My father was a universalist for the sake of peace in the family. He went along with my mother, but his own beliefs were his own. Uh, I was not brought up Jewish in any sense of the word in the religious context, but I was in the Jewish community. Culturally, I'm bicultural. My wife, my kids are Israeli Jews. I'm bicultural and bilingual. Well, more than bilingual, but I speak Hebrew and English. Point four. The Saknuti Yehudi, the Jewish agency, who determines Jewish identity only for legal and civil purposes, not religious purposes, gave me something called the Teoda Zeut, an immigration certificate in which they stated that I was legally Jewish. The Jewish agency assigned me the Jewish identity ethnically, never assigned it to myself. There's a process called Aliyah, they vet you, they do certain things, and they decided, bang, we'll give this guy a Jewish identity in his Teodazi. The rabbis would never recognize it for any religious purpose. But for legal purposes, the Saknut said I was Jewish, my DNA shows my ancestry, and it's certainly not German. I was sent to the Jewish Community Center, 
but I did not grow up in the Jewish faith. Now, in Israel, at the time when I immigrated, there were tens of thousands of people in the same situation. They were classified legally as Jews, but they were not of the Jewish religion. Tens of thousands. Not anymore. Today, it is hundreds of thousands. There are literally hundreds of thousands of Israeli citizens who have some Jewish identity and they get a Teodazayut, an identity certificate, saying that they're legally Jews, but they have no Jewish religion or background or immediate ancestry or ethnicity as such, but some basis that they used usually to get out of the old Soviet Union. Once the Iron Curtain collapsed, hundreds of thousands of these people flocked into Israel. They have special uh, brigades of the Israeli army, so they'll have a Christian chaplain, even though their ID says that they were Olim Hadashim, Jewish immigrants. This is not unusual in Israel. The Saknut classified me this way for legal purposes, but in actuality, my father was not Jewish. We're talking here only about descent and Although I was in the Jewish community center, I was in the Jewish community, I was not in the Jewish faith. Now those are the simple facts. My name was anglicized to James and I changed it back to Jacob, or well, they changed it in Israel because they translate James as Yaakov Jacob. And that's how it happened. And I, I've made all this clear. Where he got this stuff where he mixes in people I never even heard of as my ancestors and he gets this artificial DNA thing that he made. He doesn't have my DNA, I have it, and it's not what he says. Now if he wants to see my documentation, I made it clear I would show it to him personally if he agrees to debate me about Doreen Virtue and his support of John MacArthur, I will bring it with me. All he has to do is show up. But he doesn't want to show up. He has to grasp at straws. Oh, he's a cult leader. Keep away from him. Oh, I have his genealogy. It's... Oh. This is all nuts. This is a man who's desperate to avoid the issue. He's a false prophet with an antichrist spirit. That's graven images. He made a graven image of a false Christ. He's got a graven image of a false Christ. His own people, not his opponents, his own people, people related to him by marriage, close family friends who followed him for years, fellow Lutheran ministers, even Dory Virtue. They all say there's something wrong with this man. These are his own people. And not only do they say it, they put it on the internet. They make videos about it. He's got a problem. And his problem is not with me. Then he goes at the Metatron thing. Well, let's just very briefly mention it. This he unfortunately got from a former friend of mine, a failed pastor and a failed author. His church imploded. It essentially disintegrated except for a few people. All his elders left, his secretary for 25 years, the whole youth group, everyone left in Exodus. They went as refugees to another church, many of them, and he called the pastor of the other church a psychopath. His church disintegrated. He's a failed pastor. It's not coming back. But he's also a failed author. His itinerant ministry as an author has fizzled his books. There's no interest in them. And I believe he's brought these failures on himself. It's, what's left of his ministry is unfortunately folding like a cheap suit. He could have been blessed of the Lord, but he went the way he did. And I'm not happy about it. I love the guy. I still love him, but he's gone. He got into this thing of the Metatron, and I'm teaching error. <laughs> And of course, the false prophet, Chris Rose, will pick up on this and try to exploit it. Instead of dealing with the real issue 
of John MacArthur and Doreen Virtue, he's got to go to something else to deflect. He's got to change the narrative. When Paul came to Athens and Corinth in the book of Acts, he told the Areopagites on Mars Hill, the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, O oh, men of Athens, I perceive you are religious in every way. I saw your shrine, Naos, to an unknown God. Let me tell you who he is. You don't know who he is. I'm going to tell you. Jesus. Then he quotes a pagan poet. He quotes something from pagan literature, from the religious poetry of the people he's trying to convert. He actually quotes it in an evangelistic presentation. Then he does something else. He cites a pagan doctrine as true. Those who were baptized on behalf of the dead. Now Paul was talking about a pagan doctrine saying, even as pagans, you knew there was an afterlife. The Mormons, of course, the Mormon cult has taken this and twisted it to make it seem like it's a Christian practice to be baptized on behalf of dead people. They've posthumously saved General Custer, Christopher Columbus, Shaka Zulu, etc. Genghis Khan, etc. It's all nonsense. Paul was talking of a pagan practice. He cites a pagan practice. He quotes pagan religious poetry, and he speaks of a pagan undefined god, or a god who was not a pagan idol, they just said they didn't know who he was. That's what he does. This is a book published by Rabbi Tzvi Nasi. Rabbi Tzvi Nasi taught Hebrew for many years at Oxford University. At Oxford University. Okay. The book is published by Annette's. In May 1970, and then republished in 1974 in March. In Jewish evangelism, this is a well known book. I'd like to just read from it. It's used in training evangelists to the Jews in witnessing to Hasidic Jews who believe the angel of the Lord is the Metatron. From their book, the Zohar. I read in Exodus 24, come up, said the Lord to Moses, come up. And they say, this is Metatron. It was the Metatron who told Moses to come up. It continues. I'll read another. Metatron is the angel, the prince of God's countenance, the messenger, in other words. In Exodus 20:19. The Metatron is the only mediator between God and man. What does the New Testament say? There's one mediator between God and man, Jesus the righteous. Who is the way to the tree of life? asked the Zohar. It is the great Metatron. Commenting on Exodus 14:19. The Metatron is called the Angel of God, Hamalak Adonai, the Angel of the Lord. Chris Roseborough even agrees that the Angel of the Lord who wrestled with Jacob is Christ, the Christophany. And we see him described with the divine adjective Pele, wondrous, to the parents of uh, Samson. The angel of the Lord. He's given the divine description. Many things like this. He goes before Israel. The angel of the Lord. Hasidic Jews call the angel of the Lord, who most Christians, including Chris Roseborough apparently, believe is Jesus, an Old Testament apparition of him or enfleshment of him. Not an apparition, simply an enfleshment, a total enfleshment. Yes, an apparition called the Christophany. 
every petition sent to the king must be through the Metatron. God will only hear the prayer in the name of the Metatron? Metatron is the mediator with God. The angel of the Lord is the same of whom it is written in Exodus 3.21. And Yehovah, Yahweh, went before them. Go by day and by night as the ancients have expanded it, or expounded it, as Metatron. The Almighty has revealed himself in no other than the Metatron, the keeper of Israel. Now, you say, there's one mediator between God and man. Prayer is only answered in his name. He's the angel of the Lord. <laughs> he reveals Yahweh. They call him Metatron. In Jewish evangelism, we'll tell you who he is. It's Jesus. Just like Paul, I'll tell you who the unknown God is. You just quoted from the Zohar. Yeah, Paul quoted a pagan poet. Things that were true. What I quoted from the Zohar were things that were in it that were true. I did nothing different than the apostles did. But I didn't invent this teaching. It's been around for decades. This edition was published before I was even saved. It was published over a year before I was saved. I didn't invent this stuff. Oh, Jacob Prash invented this. This is nonsense. I was first taught this stuff in a Jewish evangelism seminar in New York as a young believer. All lies. All lies. Now on the teaching, I begin and end and several times during it warn people, Kabbalah is a cult. It is Zohar is a cult. It comes from Babylonian Gnosticism. It's all mysticism. Be careful. I warn what it is. But it has elements of truth in it as points of contact for the people you're trying to reach, just like Paul in Athens. I saw your shrine to an unknown God. I see you're religious in every way. I'll tell you who he is. Jesus. Quotes, he quotes from the religious poetry of the pagans. I quote from the Zohar. If it says something true, yes. The, He's the intermediary. He's the angel of the Lord. God only hears prayers in his name. You call him Metatron. I'll tell you who he is. It's Jesus. Now this has been going on in Jewish evangelism before I was even saved. I may have packaged and presented it in a way that was suitable for our ministry. Uh, to the people we're trying to reach. Normally this is taught to full-time or a professional evangelist, I hate to use that term, experienced evangelist to the Jews or to people with a theological education who know Hebrew. What I'm guilty of is taking the same exact teaching and putting it into non-academic terms for ordinary Christians to be able to witness to Hasidic Jews. That's all I did. I warned the Zohar I was pagan. He's got to jump all over me for this. Then he's got to jump all over me as a Wikipedia genealogist saying nonsense, making DNA charts that's not even my DNA. Well, I've invited him to debate me and I'll show him the documentation and the proof. Let's go on. I'm a cult. He has to go to someone like that, promoted by the Menelaus, that I'm a cult? S -s somebody who, who has no religious beliefs, who represents people of any sexual persuasion or deviation, or he represents people of any cult or religious sect or false religion? That, that's where he gets this. This is a desperate man. He will not deal with the issues. He's a false prophet. He has to hide in back of his religion. But then we have people who really disappoint me. I find it almost impossible to believe that Phil Johnson doesn't know that John MacArthur is wrong 
And it's not the first time John MacArthur has been wrong. Even other fundamentalist Baptists have said it. That you can take the mark of the beast and still be saved. Okay, maybe. But then there's going to be people who actually do. No, it does not ever say that. It doesn't say that. It says this. I saw the thrones. And they sat on them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead or on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. Whoever takes the mark is not in the resurrection of the righteous. They don't enter the millennium. That's what it says. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And now, Tao and Yaunes, they have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name, whoever, whoever. And so it goes. Revelation 16, verse 2. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, the bowl of wrath. And it became like a loathsome malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. No exceptions, whoever. You've sold your soul to Satan. It belongs to him. You don't belong to the Lord and you can't belong to the Lord. Oh, it's not the unpardonable sin. It doesn't matter. That's not the issue. They're not going to repent. It's a death sentence. There'll be people who refuse to take the mark and will be killed, but the rest... John MacArthur invented this. It's a dangerous false doctrine. And it's being perpetrated against the elect. The elect, the people who normally have discernment, the people who are supposed to be doctrinally knowledgeable and astute, the people who went to Master Seminary and who are in grace to you, and John MacArthur's church in the San Fernando Valley, these are the people who are supposed to have it together. These are supposed to be the ones who are the real elect, the solid Christians. And they're buying into this. Chris Rosebro, who masquerades as some kind of an apologist, yes, he says false things about a lot of things that are absolutely dangerous. Oh, he may be an apologist against certain errors, but that is the masquerade he uses well. Joseph Stalin hated Hitler, but he was no better than Hitler. Chris Rosebro may be against Benny Hinn or Kenneth Copeland, but he's no better. No, it's not like that. Doreen Virtue, I don't know if she was ever saved, but how do you get saved to a false Christ? You got a false Christ, a false prophet who makes a, a false image, and then those who deny what the mark actually means, which is eternal perdition. False Christ, his image, his mark. Doreen Virtue, Chris Rosebro, Phil Johnson. Why? If possible, the elect will be deceived. Apart from the faithful Jewish believers, Satan's got Israel. The false church, Rome, the World Council of Churches, Eastern Orthodoxy, Satan has those. He's always had them. 
the apostate church, those churches and denominations that once had the truth but departed from it, the Southern Baptist, the Elam movement in England, the, 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 the Methodists, they all had the truth at one time. Now Satan's got the apostate church. He's going for the elect. And he's succeeding with false Christs, his image, and ultimately his mark. Please pray for the Christians who are deluded by these men and their serious teaching. And please pray that someone like Phil Johnson repents. I honestly believe that man knows better. Chris Rosebro, he's blind, he's deaf, he can't see, he can't hear, he doesn't really count. He's like his graven image. Doreen Virtue, <laughs> look for yourself. But even she knows there's something wrong with Chris Rosebro. Well, that's about it, friends. Not a pleasant message. Not one I like sharing. But unfortunately, a needed one. This is the reality. Satan is preparing the way for Antichrist, and if possible, the elect will be deceived. False Christ, false prophet, his image, and his mark facilitated by false teachers. <coughs> Believe me, I wish to God I was wrong, but I'm not. If possible, it obviously is possible for the elect to be deceived. I beseech you by the mercies of Jesus, don't be deceived. Thank you for listening. My name is James Jacob Prash, Boreal Ministries, speaking to you, RTN TV.